Okay, so this video is going to be all about light, electromagnetic waves, and the ether. So we're actually going to start by taking this in a little bit of a different direction. So I want to show you where the idea of the ether comes from. So we meet have met all kinds of waves previously. So uh, something we meet quite regularly is water waves like you see in the sea. So the wave travels by oscillating water particles up and down perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. So the wave is causing water particles to move. That's how it transfers its energy. Consider sound waves. So sound waves travel by oscillating particles, uh, for example, air molecules, and it, they oscillate them parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So sound waves travel by oscillating particles. So physicists studying light were like, well, light's behaving like a wave. We've seen it do things like interference and diffraction. So we know it behaves like a wave. So it must be oscillating something. And that thing is what we call the or they called the ether. They think it's the thing that permeates all of space that light is oscillating in order to travel. So that's where the more idea of the ether comes from. Light is often described as an electromagnetic wave, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how that deduction came about, or one of the ways that deduction came out, I should say. So if you look up an electromagnetic wave online, especially if you go on like Google Images, you will see an image like this one. So you will see the black line showing you the direction of travel of the wave. And then we've got these fields, the electric field and the magnetic field being shown to be caused to oscillate by that wave. So that's the image we often get with electromagnetic wave. This was some, a field of study that was going on in parallel to science's study of light. So there were two fields which both being investigated, but were completely separate from the point of view of physicists at the time. So um, that we're going to look take a look at how those two fields are <laughs> fields nice uh, fields are brought together. One key thing to know about electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic fields is that a stationary charge will be sending out electric waves into their surroundings. So if we say something has an electric field, what that really suggests is it's sending out waves into its surroundings. That's how it's able to tra transfer information to something to say, you know, you need to be attracted to me or I, you need to be repelled from me, that kind of thing. So I, I, the way I think about it, a charge is sending out information into its space um, that can affect other things with charge. It's the same idea with magnetic fields, except they're created by moving charges. Again, we've got this idea that we're sending out information into the surroundings that can um, then other particles get affected by it. That's how I kind of think about what these fields are. There are a set of equations we use to describe electric and magnetic fields and how they interact and relate to one another. And those are called the Maxwell's equations. Um, they are actually the summary of a, a series of different equations by a whole range of physicists. Um, but these are the equations that describe how an electromagnetic wave works. Essentially, you can use Maxwell's equations to predict the existence of electromagnetic waves, and you can use it to predict a speed at which they travel, three times in a, a speed at which they travel in a vacuum, and that's three times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's the key idea to take away. Uh, those equations look scary. Um, we're not going to worry too much about those. The key thing is we can use them to predict the electromagnetic waves traveling at three times 10 to the eight meters per second. If you would like to know a little bit more about these equations and maybe how you use them to predict the speed at which uh, electromagnetic waves travel, I would direct you towards this video that you can see here by Dr. Physics. It goes into it in a bit more detail uh, than we will do in the A-level course. And um, so if you're interested, do check that out. Okay, so back to Maxwell's equations. So what we now then had, or what was going on simultaneously to all this work by Maxwell and all of these other scientists, was they were trying to measure how fast light travels. And there'd, there'd been all sorts of ideas about how fast it would travel. Some scientists thought it was infinitely fast. Some people thought it was finite. 
And to answer that question, you actually had to measure the speed of light. But And once they did, they measured it to be 3 times 10 to the 8 in a vacuum. And then, therefore, you're able to get this idea, taking the work from Maxwell's equations and this measurement, that, in fact, light is an electromagnetic wave. So. If you're interested in how they actually went about measuring the speed of light, uh, it's a quite a simple little experiment, but uh, a really neat idea. Uh, again, that was done by a physicist called Pizzo, and again, Doc Physics has a really nice video on this, um, so I would highly recommend you go check that out if you want to know more about that. So, what we've got so far is that scientists think light travels through an ether, so that's what it's making vibrate that permeates through all the space. They've worked out it's an electromagnetic wave because they've measured its speed to be the predicted speed of an electromagnetic wave. So what they now need to do is actually go, OK, so we think there's an ether. How do we actually test whether there is one or not? Is our idea correct? So um, essentially, they used a principle called Galilean relativity. So to boil it down, I'm going to use a parallel analogy with sound. So let's imagine that sound can travel at speed c in stationary air. So if we shout with the wind, that sound information is going to travel faster than c because you're going to add on to it the speed at which the air is traveling. So the speed of sound you would measure to be c plus the velocity of the wind. If you shout into the wind, although the information can travel at c through the air, because the air is traveling towards you, it moves away from you at C minus the speed at which the wind is traveling. So this is the big picture idea behind how you test for whether there is an ether or not. You're essentially going to do an experiment where you should get the speed of light changing if you're able to line up with the ether uh, or against it. So that's the big idea. So. As I said, this is an idea of Galilean relativity, essentially speed adding together to produce bigger or smaller speeds. And so if the Earth were moving parallel to the ether, we'd and in the same and in the same direction as it, we'd expect to measure a bigger speed of light because we'd add their two velocities together. If the Earth were moving parallel to the ether and in the opposite direction, we'd expect a smaller speed of light to be measured. And if the Earth were traveling perpendicular to the ether, we'd expect to have no change and would measure 3 times 10 to the 8. So what we're doing is we're imagining this ether as like a wind that's blowing through space and light is just essentially traveling on that wind. That's what they're imagining the ether is. They came up with an experiment that would allow us to test whether or not this is actually true. Does the speed of light change depending on the motion or in this case, the Earth, because that's where we're doing the experiment. So what they've done is they've set up a system where we get light to travel in two perpendicular directions. The idea being that they will be moving at different angles to the ether, so light should travel at different speeds in those perpendicular directions. So if we look at the interference pattern made when we superpose those two light waves together, it should indicate that they've taken different times to get there. So the, that, 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 that's the big idea. And we're not going to go into more, much more detail than that. But that's the big idea. The interference pattern should show they've traveled at different speeds in the different directions there. Um, if you would like a little bit more information, I keep directing to lots of different videos here because we're kind of glossing over things quite a bit. Uh, there is a nice experiment, uh, a video on the experiment of Mickelson Morley uh, that is available here. I would take big issue with the name of this experiment, though, um, because as you may see where this is going, actually, this experiment shows that there is no difference in the speed of light in those perpendicular directions. So it's called a failed experiment. But as far as I'm concerned, an experiment that disproves an idea is a very successful one. So I, I take issue with the um, greatest failed experiment ever title, uh, but it's a good video otherwise. So do check that out. What they did is they found out that the time taken was the same. So essentially, 
they found out that light was traveling at the same speed in those perpendicular directions. And so they disposed of this idea of an ether that's permeating through space or a light wind that was kind of passing through space that you could kind of add or subtract the speed of light on. So where we're going to go next is looking at Einstein's theory of special relativity. Um, so the idea behind this, or one of the ideas behind this, is we need to explain the results of this experiment. And one of the key proposals in Einstein's theory of special relativity is that the speed of light is constant regardless of your motion, which tallies up with what we've seen from this experiment. So we'll meet that in the next video.